This is a, I call it a transmutation of a poem called Laissez Passer by Amy Cesar. So I kind of, it's kind of trans, translation, kind of my own version of it. So it's called Let It Slide. Facile prolongation of swallow reflex by the obscene hermetic mouth of this dark, prolific muck. Reflux of gluey herbal carnivores hearing within sticky pedestals, bonding news deemed necessary in this world choked by a grim idiot wind, masking the verve of yellow inversions. Crutch, crutch over vertiginous abyss, vertiginous, vertiginous abyss. Crutch, crutch over nothingness, crutch, crutch over inferno. But even midair, I meet a thousand wedded knives, a thousand cruel lassos, a thousand sacerdotal crows. Roar, strike rock and sand, I people with fish. Let Logos loom over factories. Echo your collaborator, echo your fiery redux, echo your silvery soapbox, echo your rails and derailments, echo your electrified utensils, echo your moronic togs, echo your spidery horizon, echo your gleaming porcelain, echo your tidy chattel ripped apart by catastrophe, echo your groans, echo your drones. I endure along unmarked parallels the procession of dim-witted tourists whose mammalian trail perpetuates untold forest ticks. Backwater, agitation. Finical cougars give their lip-curling grimace at the very scent of me. The air halts. I hear the grinding of each pole on its ambiguous axis. The air snarls. Projectile dysfunction stalls the decolonization of my mind. The air clouds. Cedar is chopped up into ridges, the skeleton of an ancient flounder stuck in the sediment like a totem, caught in similarly murky times, carved by a tribe of next to none. You guys have been doing some workshops. Jennifer still did a workshop, and you've got, you have some workshops going on. So this is a, uh, actually a sequence called The Workshop. And so you know I've kind of found a way to work it all into this reading. So I'll read a few of these. Uh, Prepare yourself for a life of perpetual summer dresses. They will always be more animated than your silly books. Prepare yourself for extensive ablutions after every erotic inkling. Once they have crowdfunded your existence, let them freeze in the dark. The poet is the unsung legislature, legis legislator of the land, but hydro is a provincial matter. See if the umbrella company for numerous supermarket chains will sponsor your onanism. Make a move to the absolute center. Prepare your lungs for living there. Rinse until something repeats. <laughs> Today we're going to fashion a Claude glass. That's a uh, Claude Laran had these special mirrors for painting, so we're going to do that today. Today we're going to fashion a Claude glass out of these errant belongings. Then we shall see exactly what we're dealing with. Mine looks like a time machine made of odds and sods from a short-lived series about an inept detective who makes use of the device every week to keep being underpaid. The beautiful daughter of the brilliant physicist helps the detective because he is beautiful. The sex they might want to have fuels the machine. My homemade mirror is nearly as grotesquely an anachronistic as her pet toy. In the same breath, I will suffer if you laugh at it for more than five seconds. No one was surprised when the machine broke down. <laughs> Come clean with them. At the end of the day, the poet must unburden itself. I lost no sleep over these prospective handlers failing to provide a place with enough counter space for my standard fee. I lost sleep over the prospect of your unknown faces and busy mouths. Forget about detectives and time machines for a minute, or another show where they stopped his heart and almost forgot to cry, clear! This analogy is so plain as a nose on a face, I can't even. Play solitaire like a shell game. The trick is to trick yourself into things. Begin to mingle before you're stuck in the middle of the road of your unread epic. Don't I know that one? <laughs> Terrorism kills less citizens per annum than falling out of bed or good old-fashioned rope burn caught in the carpal tunnel of love. Only you can prevent these wildfires. Recall how the beautiful daughter of the brilliant physicist saved the detective from a gas explosion. The trick is to scamper up the rope without slipknotting some kind of ladder or doodad we no longer fix. You collect yourself and notice that you have been sawn in two. In the footlights, you can scarcely make out your wriggling feet. The fatal flaw is not paying enough attention in geography. All I can recall are texts brimming over with personified spermatozoa. No, I mean science after continental drift. Admirable spunk, thwarted by topographical anomalies. Each one of the little buggers leaves a sizable, or so we hope, 
depression. Consider the plains of Abraham. Tonight, text a page turner about the subject formation of an identity in a frozen landscape that captures its pathetic fallacy to a T. Sounds like the grammar police, flanked by Aristotle, are keen as mustard for everything to fit together. Our humble pie is still cooling on the sill. Prairie surrealism is accustomed to such disjuncture. Signifiers shed signification during temperature drop. You try to get your shoes repaired and end up bloated with bro nuts. Any media flunky will concur. If Cosmo tells you how to best please with a bro nut, you've just got to roll with it. Transubstantiation of a Taurus sounds right up your alley. One day, thistle lipstick upon the crumbs will throw off your airtight theory. The explosion did not eliminate our heathen research. The beautiful daughter of the brilliant physicist and the inept detective always arrive in the 11th hour. A truncated message from our sponsor. Such exploits will cost the eyes out of your head. This palpable loss, the kind Rilke would have lapped up, was only unconsummated shards of their platonic attachment. In deleted scenes, firemen confirm that erotic tension caused the blast. By now, we should be up to our neck in prairie surrealism. Let's stop getting sidetracked by the explosion that kick-started all things, and that goes for this unwelcome eruption. The dramatization of the explosion on the news was next-level mud-flinging. We watched them make love over and over again upon a bed of clever tentacles. In the season finale, an old flame is terrified their time machine will be better or bigger than his time machine. Time travel is something anyone can manage with these simple guidelines. Just keep at it until your life can pass in the lecherous wink of some euphemistic eye. The beautiful daughter of the brilliant physicist and the inept detective could have had quite a lark instead of using the time machine to pull double shifts and chart the negative capability of love in an ironic universe. By the time they got around to caressing the time crystal, they were cancelled. <laughs> so this um, part of this work is from a, a new collection coming out next year called Safety Sand. And um, the, this part I've done, uh, I went up to Flin Flon and I've been thinking a little bit about their, um, and, and the Paw, but I've been thinking about their, uh, their movement from a mining community to, an, to, they're trying to become an arts center and there's been a lot of uh, stuff in the paper about that. And so I've been thinking also about um, the John Vickers who was like, he, um, he went up to Flin Flon and he was working in Woolworths there and then he was in Winnipeg and he was kind of training here with, um, I think, a United Church uh, organist and he did a lot, had a lot of history in, in Manitoba before going off to become the famous Canadian Heldon Tenor. And so this, 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 so I'm going to read two pieces from this. Um, work that's called Ideas of North. And so this one's a sort of a tribute, this, this number seven is a tribute to uh, John Vickers. We subsist at a key so low, the music of the wood frogs beckons us back with a din, like quibbling ducks that drive the usual croakers out to the road, just to be heard, little green tenors mimicking Vickers. Temple on the trist and mind, der Sonne liegt nicht scheit. Es ist das Dunkel nagelang, da rast die Mutter mit Schenzand. All dem in Tode sie empfangen. Just the trick to hoodwink listeners, even choir master and misses tracking the tones in every poem. Next stop, Carnegie Hall. Though the reception is incredible, and for once no one asks where ideas come from. As far more vital precepts spring to mind in the presence of the new arrival from South Africa, whose accent could charm magpies off the rocks, say that discretion is the better part of encounters that have never been noting a likeness, a shadow, a throbbing hope, nothing like the heft of very real purple potatoes in our haversack, say a kind word that crystallizes between our ears like a branch dropped into a salt mine, begging the question, is the word real? Is the branch real? Is the mine real? No, let the moment cool like a bit of smelt, because ordering a batch of Stendhal might not make a dent in memories of a prairie town outside of Johannesburg, 
and the subjugated reader must return to the more reliable heft of purple potatoes in deft recitation of our former mantra. The double helix hologram on rear license plate stocks is the only real thing in this freaking place. And so I'll read the last one in that sequence. So This one was, uh, was it in La Paz? Maybe not. One of those places. We return to reality, take our time around Amisk Lake, stop to admire suckers and jackfish together at last, still wary of bears and what cannot be suppressed, the vital force of every letter, off-kilter impulses and impressions, recently picked in spite of frost warnings, luscious images confined to nibbling, that voluptuous gush, that heap of warm recriminations upon subjective chair of marble eggs, where the blessed Ludovica Albertoni clutches her least sinister breast, writhing in her ecstasy over a bit of pre-volcanic tapestry that tricks the eye that sees the neck ring of red cedar being fastened around our seditious napes in the name of civilization, leaving oscillations of swelling affection that teach the true value of barter, yet chiefly that here among tundra swans with strange undulations, the ridge on his bill, a veritable gonflation of desire during breeding season, here in the jewel of all this jagged boreality, a pelican appears and surrealism is born. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I've left uh, a little bit of space in the reading in case you want to ask anything, but I tend to, well, anyway, I'll, I'll just do what I do. But I will uh, thank uh, Catherine and Margaret and Molly for their organizational work. It's been uh, splendid, uh, easy, kind of knew what I was supposed to be doing all along the way. So uh, thank you very much, uh, where, wherever you all are. Um, so, yes, hi, Jay, hi, Jay, hi, hi, a pie, a pie, Uh, that poem uh, was, uh, <laughs> aside from this moment here, written by Kurt Schwitters in about 1919. It's called um, Fuhrer of Sneezing. <laughs> Report from the front of the soon to form thoughts. Get rid of all those bits of paper, whole, torn, folded or not. It is man's body that is poetry and the streets. Traffic of phonemic breakdown, tongue-trilled, gurgling fricatives. It's women's body, I say. Flow, music, disjunction, polyvalence, emotion and thought and form step through the arch, vamp the ramp in ill-fitted word garb. I try to be pre-articulate to catch that veil, that split-second flash at entrance, grab in the shred between sensation and speech. No longer speaking, listening with the whole body, pulse that precedes breath, the head of ah, on the entranced lips of the beholder. Far before the poise of syntax, the power turn of co-option. How to break into that circuit, that pattern. I am reading before shape, the architecture of lack, the back pull to the void that is full but belies utterance. T -t -t a transient ischemic attack that jumbles my syllables, shakes the brain bag and strains for utterance that stays locked behind clotted receptors. No one is safe, not the customer, the costumer, I. 
I grope back for familiar to propel I on. Am tempted to take it easy, to take the ramp, tramp the authorship trail, draw the lights to myself, not to the ions of speech. But I am unauthorized, dispossessed, a faux phonologist, no matter what I say. Who's the creator here anyway? Maybe language, after all, despite itself. I try, though it feels impossible, to reinvent my lips. Uh, that piece is from Flutter Tongue Three Disarray. Uh, in, in that book, I was uh, attempting to write the way a jazz musician plays jazz and, uh, and uses improvisation and riffs. And, uh, and I wasn't trying to write about jazz, I was trying to write as if I was jazz. And uh, uh, whether I made it or not is not for me to judge, but it was, it was a gas to, to do that work. The Flutter Tongue overtitle that I have for the last six books uh, grew out of a notion that I had at one point when I was writing uh, that really all the work I was doing was one work. Uh, I mean, that's not an uncommon uh, thought for a, a poet to have, but it came to me kind of in a very revelatory way. And uh, I guess in part because I think of my each work uh, as, as trying to find a new method of composition to enter the poetic realm. It's a way to, uh, as I've said before, to, it's a way to keep myself from getting bored. And it's a way to challenge myself so that I'm not just doing the same old thing. Um, I mean, I just, yeah. So uh, Flutter Tongue 4, Adagio for the Pressured Surround, was a real breakthrough for me because uh, after struggling for a long time, I suddenly saw how this could be a book-length poem. So it's one poem. It's book length, uh, flutter tongue for adagio for the pressured surround. So I've I've just picked a random two pages to read from that. Perhaps I am the afterlife of kingfisher, hovering, regurgitating to build my nest. The unassuming poem erases itself, but leaves a trace. Perhaps, if you are reading. Are you? You are considering the stability of the structure of random twigs and threads. My make-do dream. And in Sweden, saffron bread is traditionally baked on the day of St. Lucille. I don't mean this as adequate. The verbs are active. That fallen nest, small and brown, but glinting, found by my son. Why write of the poem in the poem? A weave of grass and string, strands of acetate, and threads of silver garland cupped in a boy's tender hand, discovering. Can never write the poem intended. I'd flown to his side to try to coax him back from oblivion. He said, I've really buggered things up this time, haven't I? So out with intention. Even this is intention. Word asunderer. What do you mean, I said. Just look, he said. You'll know what I mean. Poet. 
plunderer. Cold snap that snaps and snaps. Long lines to wrap and warm your neck. But tongues pulled out from under you. Perhaps it is simply fear you will become the one who never arrives. Wanderer with no story, no aboutness. You will abrade space with absence, an invisible wound. So uh, I was talking to Margaret this morning and I was saying that uh, 100 years ago, 101 years ago now, I guess, in Zurich there was a, a Dada event, uh, really the event that kicked off the Dada art era. It was called uh, Cabaret Voltaire and it was in Zurich in Switzerland. And it was uh, a place where Hugo Ball performed the first things that became known as sound poems. And uh, um, oh, I could go into that quite a lot, but I thought in honor of it being 101 years since, in February actually, it was February of 2016 was the 100th anniversary of the Cabaret Voltaire. So we're at 101 plus a bit now and I thought I would read one Hugo Ball sound poem and it's called Clouds. Elomen elomen lefetelomenal, wo minuscaio, Baumala bunga kia kam glas to la faro fem flinzi. El minuscula, plu plubash rala la laio. Endremen saxa sa flumen flobo la la. Filo bash falia da fole di flumbash. Kero badrada, glugla guda, glugloda glodash. Gluglamen gluglada gleroda glandredi. Elomen elomen lefet alomenai, woman sky o, baumbala bunga akya kam, glass dollar fire of him blisty, elomen iskula, blue blue shralabataio. Hugo Ball. Um, interesting thing about Hugo Ball is that uh, he did these sound poems, very chant like he was in a big costume you can read about him in, uh, on the web, <laughs> where can you read about everything these days. And um, he did these chanting kind of poems and uh, after a while they, uh, the effect of them became so strong he kind of went into a, a, a kind of catatonic space and eventually he gave up performing them and, and became a kind of a, a religious mystic uh, way out in the countryside. Uh, um, I forget exactly where right now. but. Um, these put him uh, into another worldly place. You know where we were trying to get in Jennifer's workshop? We were trying to get into another space, another place. Well, he went way, way out there. <laughs> um, so, yeah. What, does anybody have a good memory? How did I introduce this book? Did I say it was Flutter Tongue 4, Adagio for the Pressured Surround? Did I say that? Oh, okay. All right. I'm having a I, I thought I introduced it with the wrong subtitle. Anyway, this is from Flutter Tongue 5, uh, Everything Appears to Shine with Mossy Splendor. And I'll just say that it, it really has two texts. I'm really interested in creating my, well, there's intertextuality and then there's intertextuality. And so I uh, found another way to do that. So I have kind of two, two texts working on each page. Let me just say that much. So I will give you the whole thing. The, the book is sort of, a, sort of about moss, sort of. Moss is fascinating, really. Read about moss. This is called Fever and Alcove. Against torpor, a need to rise, though a gray weight sits poultice heavy on the sleeper, so feeds recurrent slumber. Every morning, life's incunabula. A bill is sent for the crucible's recovery, trembling, furnished, the body puts up a fight. 
Dial-up technology thwarts the seeker, dove-colored cuffs at his wrists. Poets are evoked for spirit, sensitivity in a chattery room whose bar is closing or in a real estate ad selling lofts. A recipe for the delicious cumin bread is savory potential. There's more, though, to see, the not loved, the loved but kept away, the loved of a kind. More words in the thesaurus, but they'll have to make their own combinations, the honking Vs of migrating geese or squealy freight train cars where wines ratchet, ricochet, pain in the couplings. Each one a customer cornered in the cup of a cell phone, switched to India, to a call center voice that bewilders. Whether to reach for the Bible or the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali to guide or to Slaughterhouse Five. A line to copy in the fray edged notebook which contains all the words of passing and hope to hold. Frustration and hopelessness itch while a worthy possibility disorients like metal stacking chairs unstacked and scattered at the icy edge by the river's flow. All pavilions aflutter, writes John Ashbury. Shake down the mercury and turn it into the pharmacy. The world's gone digital. Chill, get a degree for happiness before the security pat-downs thorough caress. And that cru call will not guide you to moss, but to a rare sighting of its avian namesake. Cord moss, Funaria hygrometrica, Cruru, avian aria. <clears throat> Excuse me for sniffling. Flutter Tongue Six is the latest uh, uh, Flutter Tongue book, um, and it's it's actually the, the publisher wanted to flip the titles around, so it's Emanations, Flutter Tongue Six, and. Uh, I just I like I have a long piece, so I, I like to extract it from the book and read it on this. It's called Lurch. Beach laced, waist, waist high, bitten by plastic jagged beads, blandished by platelets, jerry slagged up from polymer sea. Lord have mercy. Stuff a bob gleams, entices, incites, glissades, and traps, increases, brand game of games, card flip, telespectacle, gaper captive to the flush of light, garbage carboniferous and flutter of likeness, cardiograph floods, telos, speculum, brass gamma of gamut, two for one today, only last chance. The beholder swears by it, buys it, wears it, weeps it, caddies it, the believer swerves on its pyramid trip. Tips queasy stomachs, toss up in hollow churn, tilts the quiet stoner in a pyrex triplex flood, a gush over lives old and newborn whose houses sink under bad debts, bad weather, bad debt, leaky writs. Nifty howlers sizzle under balconies, fluorescence gyrates over lighthouse decisions. Quick, pass the broom, just the handle might do. Its skinny buoyancy, handy bristles to float, to swift particulate off the junk, to flourish, to swink, passe off the jupon. Slapstick bureaucracy, hard-boiled broad brim, natty dealer enters the press, scrum, hanky-panky dodge, patent shoes, tap a brisk drum step across the waft, a buffed snare trail of garb status, Armani morning jacket, cardboard shack, a marked deck, a marsupial decline, attrition cells, everything must go, chin held just so in pause, in poise as if a crown above, a posture lulls as if a crucifixion overhead with ceremonies, banner and bane, postponement and delay, with certificate Gets bonsai and banjo, chinchilla herded just so in pawn shop, in pokeweed, all cuffs and gems behind the starch, below starling murmurations, all guff and dirty wrists, all the collars sullied, the suits, a ragged up clown, all disarming rhinex, the diamond card, the ace in hand, in a blink flicks up a cuff, a hangman cardiology. Casino camera scans feedback through lens, through tinted one-way glass to screens, beside the case of semi-automatic guns, beside the seminal avenaceous gusts, through titillated opalescent gleam, surveillance framed and digitized. Paradise is scrutiny en route through the rubble heap. Paragraphs are freed from poetry's dilapidated sculpture and shrouded in rubric heartburn. 
Here or there, defibrillation, thievery, and therapy, beside mottled lawns, cons, bus bombs, Bushmaster concession bonanzas, waves grind on the buried beach, slough the cabled beadwork debris, spill bloom and decay, the tune of the tide, it's stack and retreat, stack and retreat, treasure and theft, stake and retype, rape and repeat, repeal and restake, waves, stack and retreat, treasure and theft, treasure and theft. Thank you. So I'll finish uh, among my sound poetry explorations. Uh, several years ago, I was thinking about the alphabet, and uh, and uh, I I kind of came up to a conclusion that every letter or s sounded letter in the alphabet, you know. I mean, the letters are just are sounds, really. Eh? Uh, anyway, each one had its equal and opposite member of the alphabet. So I um, came up with thirteen pairs, and um, uh, so I kind of like to restrict uh, an improvisation that I do around those pairs to the two letters in the pair. If you get me, for example, a pair. Uh, E and P are a pair, but they're not E and P. I didn't pick them because they rhyme. You know, it's A and P. So, but I'm not going to do that one. So instead, I'm going to do num <coughs> number 10. Uh, just improv here. Don't need my glasses. Thank <laughs> you. 